Mac Power Users, Episode 559, Research Apps. Hello, everyone. This is David Sparks, joined by my fellow co-host, your friend of mine, Mr. Stephen Hackett. Hey, Stephen. Hey, David. How are you today? Good. Uh, this outline got a little crazy, uh, I'll just say. <laughs> yeah. I feel like... Um, you know, some shows come together easy and some shows come together hard. And uh, this one uh, has uh, been the fruits of many hours on my behalf. And it's not just research for the show. I've been kind of looking at these apps for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I've mentioned on the show in the past that I was goofing off with Rome Research. And we thought, well, let's do kind of an overview show. Of some of these research apps, not just Rome, but some of the others. We've got several on on the docket for today. And I had an interesting experience in preparing for the show. I actually found myself kind of switching to a different app. So that's kind of fun when that happens. Yeah, I uh, I just got back from vacation and I literally went to the mountains, to the woods. But I came back and yesterday I opened the Google Doc because uh, I have some thoughts as well on these apps and some experience with them. And I was like, oh, I may have just come back from vacation, but David went to the mountaintop. Know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like I have a um, a Saturday schedule. You know, I take care of like processing all the household mail and all that stuff. And Saturday morning, I said, "Well, I'll just go into the outline for a couple hours," and then I basically spent the whole day on the outline. <laughs> yeah, but the um, but we have some of these apps really deserve full shows, and we will be getting back to them. Like one of the apps we're not going to cover in great detail today is Notion, and I'll explain why. But I'm actually working right now on landing a really good guest to give us a whole show on Notion. So. Before you start firing up your email machine and getting angry because we didn't cover your research app of choice, just just trust us that uh, this is an interesting and evolving topic that uh, we'll, we'll be getting more coverage. And it's one that's become a lot more interesting even in the last year or so. Like Some of the ones we're going to look at are very, very new. And, yeah. and then you have, on the other hand, you have things like DevonThink or Evernote, which we're also not covering, but people didn't really know what Evernote does that have been around a really long time. It's just so interesting to me that in a category of apps that seems like there would be plenty of opportunity and options for, for any user that developers are still finding places in the market where they can, you know, carve out their own little corner. And, and some of these newer apps are very opinionated in that as, as we get through them, I think you'll see what we mean, but but yeah, it's it's an overview. We're definitely going to circle back to some of these in greater detail in the future. And one of the things that kind of came out of the research for this one was that, you know, research apps is a very generic term, but there are very different types of tools. Like Dev and Think is, it's a library tool. I mean, you put PDFs and documents and everything in it, and it does artificial intelligence to help you tie things together. Some of these other apps we're going to cover are basically notes apps, but they've come at it from a new direction in terms of ways to link notes together that make them more useful than a historical note app. So uh, they they really do scratch different niches. But I, anyway, I think I've done enough apologizing before we even started the show. But it, <laughs> it's really, uh, it's an interesting area. And you're right, there's a ton of evolution going on. And um, it's very exciting as a nerd to see things developing like this Mm -hmm. so uh it'll be definitely an ongoing topic and the other thing the other i guess caveat i put the top of the show is we are also in the midst of planning an academic research show i'm not an academic near steven um we've been to college I, i went to graduate school but it's not the same thing as people who make their living writing papers as academics and we've got a couple listeners slash guests plan that are really going to help us cover that topic so like the bibliography tools and things like that we're not going to get into today but we'll we'll Mm -hmm. get to that so so don't get mad at me if you're an academic (laughs) and you're like this sparky guy talking research oh give me a break right you know (laughs) the way i think about these apps like who i think they're for are people like you and i and i think a lot of our listeners who are sort of quote like knowledge workers where we have a lot of information that we need to process and store and refer to later and we need a system to manage all of that i think that's what these apps are after not that you can't use them for those other things but that's kind of how we're approaching them because that's how we use them 
Yeah, but there, there's another level to it. And this is where Rome opened my eyes. And that is a lot of the stuff I do is text-based. You know, I write down notes and thoughts and do tons of research where I'm dragging text out of one place or another or summarizing articles. We talked a little bit recently about my Readwise workflow out of, um, you know, out of eBooks. And so there was there was a place missing for me. And the real question, I think, in hindsight that I was looking to answer when I kind of started this journey was, can you program serendipity? You know, can you have an app where you start putting your thoughts into it and make it, have it start trying to make connections for you, just like the synapses of your brain connect things? And the answer is kind of, yes, you can. And so I think it gets beyond the mere cataloging, but also gets into connections. And uh, that's what makes this so fascinating to me. The Another thing I found out throughout this process is it really feels like the old uh, Windows versus Mac world where there's a bunch yeah. of people that are like choosing sides. And that is, I can't think of anything more stupid than getting partisan over a research app. But apparently some people <laughs> do that, you know, and uh, and I in general, because I've been dipping my toes in a bunch of them and I found the communities around each one of them. Most of these do have communities around them are very accepting and helping but there are also a lot of them, there's certain, you know, voices in these communities are like, oh, that app is bad. No, they're they're all pretty good. Honestly, anything that makes the cut on a Mac Power Users episode is there because we think it's worth looking into. We're not going to waste your time with junk. That's right. Uh, so there's there's good apps here. And, um, and I didn't know how to really break it down, but I, I thought, well, you know, research apps were, are things there to help you find things, uh, fundamentally help you think and connect you know, stray threads between your ears, you know, find ways to make connections between things. I'll, I'll use a very simple example. So I, I started studying like Buddhism in like the eighties and, you know, I'm not going to get into religion on the show, blah, blah, but the, uh, but I do think there are useful pieces of Buddhism. So I take notes when I read books and I've got these notes, these many, many, you know, text files worth of notes but then recently I kept reading about how everybody is into stoicism. I thought, well, I'll just check it out. And it was interesting to me that as I was taking notes, some of these apps were connecting elements of those two different theories. One is Eastern, one is Western, but the apps were trying to connect them for me. And I'm like, yeah, that's the kind of thing I want. Something where I can take notes on different ideas and have the app try to connect them for me. So uh, I'm not looking to replace my brain, but I'm looking for a little help. You need what you can get. Uh, a book I read that kind of influenced this was Sanke Aaron's book, How to Take Smart Notes. Uh, I was turned on to this by Mike Schmitz over on the Focus podcast. And by the way, if you listen to MPU, try Focus. I think Mike and I have been doing a pretty good job on that show lately. Um, but either way, so I, I read that book and it kind of got me thinking about, you know, what am I doing with my strategy? And then I got looking into ways for this specific show, how can we objectively analyze some of these apps to give the listeners something to hold on to? And the four bits that I thought kind of really help are collect, you know, how good are these apps at collecting data for you? Connect, how good are they at making connections for you? Outlining and writing. And I feel like outlining and writing are often an endpoint for this stuff. Some of these apps try to give you that as well. So you can not only do the collection and connection, but you can actually start writing there or outlining there. Some of them aren't that good at that. Some of them are really excel at it. But there's all these different kind of balances of this or different, you know, versions of this soup, I guess. And as we get through the show, we're going to try and give you kind of a summary on each of those four points or each of these apps we're going to cover, which will hopefully as a listener give you a nice place to start out if you want to try some of these apps out. Yeah, I really like that that approach of the four different steps because I know for me sometimes in the past, before I sort of settled on the system I have now, I would struggle with, okay, I can like collect things and maybe I can even have some sort of organization that brings them together in interesting ways. But what happens after that has always been sort of a, a drop-off for me. And some of these tools make that, really easy to go from the collection and connection stages to outlining and writing. And other of these apps, you know, you're going to have your research on one side of your screen and your writing on the other. And the the idea here, though, is to have stuff, I think, in a system where you can 
you can get to it and it's useful for you when it needs to be. Because otherwise you're just collecting junk, right? Otherwise you're just a digital hoarder. And and as someone who is someone like that, I have found over the years, especially the last year or so using DevonThink, which we'll get to, putting the work in on the front end and then having an app that has some smarts about it makes my collection of research and documents more useful to me when it's time to sit down and work. And that's the goal or otherwise you're just right. You're just collecting bits. Yeah. Well, I mean that like, that's a common problem I see. Like I have friends that are really into Evernote Mm -hmm. and then when they'll sit down with me, they'll show me their Evernote library and they are digital orders. I mean, they have got thousands and thousands of PDFs and documents in Evernote and then I'll say, well, how often do you read them? Or what do you do with them? And they're like, well, I have them here if I need them. So it's it's more like, I guess, a, an archive or a library than actually a thinking tool, a research tool, which is fine, but you should know that going in. I mean, what are, what is the goal you're looking for? And that's the reason why I kind of got to these four elements. It's like, I think you need to kind of give some thought to what is it that you want this app to do for you? The, there was a tweet, and I forget, the woman's name that made it, I will find it and put it in the show notes though. But she was talking about um, the differences between Rome research, uh, notion and Evernote. And she broke it down. She talked about, she said, look, there are, you know, three times the people there's librarians who want to be able to go and find their books, you know, Dewey decimal people. And those people are great with Evernote. Then there are architects, people who want to like design a system like you would design a house and then put their data into it with this nice, you know, pre-formatted architecture. And those are notion people. And then they're gardeners who just want to collect a bunch of stuff and then let the garden grow and prune where they think they want to prune, but let it grow where they want it to grow. And, you know, that mindset gardener, architect, librarian is a great way to kind of choose which tool you want. But we're, you know, we're not even really covering Evernote and Notion in this outline because I'm not sure those are the apps that I would I would recommend for this stuff. But I thought that was a nice mindset to kind of think about it because it is kind of true as you go through some of these apps, different apps lend themselves to different personalities. Yeah, I think that's definitely right. And I really like that, that analogy because it's something that's sort of easy to wrap your head around, right? Like in thinking about that, you know, and again, we're not, talking about notion we keep talking how we're not talking about things sorry yeah so I know. sorry <laughs> there's just a lot here you know yeah. but like notion yeah you go and build the system that you want in it and rome you sort of put this the, your information into it and it kind of becomes its own thing and evernote and i think dev and think are people who just want to have like these big archives that they can search and and service things later so i really like that yeah i've, I've got that tweet in the show notes because it's it is a fascinating take yeah, and she actually got the idea from a George R. R. Martin quote, who's the guy who did who wrote Game of Thrones. Yeah, um, nice. But the um, I, I do think that, so let's just close the loop on Notion. The reason Notion is in any outline is because we ran out of time and we're going to have a separate show on it. And I think that Notion is a great tool for collaboration, but for some of the stuff we're going to talk about here today, I don't think Notion is like the best solution for that. Agreed. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by the IntraZone by Microsoft SharePoint. I love finding new podcasts. There's such a huge world out there. And if you're looking for a new show to check out, the IntraZone is a biweekly podcast with conversations and interviews on how Microsoft SharePoint, OneDrive, and related technologies can work for you. You'll hear from guest experts behind the scenes and out in the field so you can see how SharePoint fits into your everyday work life to easily share and manage content, knowledge, and applications. Each show covers a bunch of segments like news and announcements, a focused topic of the week, guest perspectives, FAQs of the week, and upcoming events. And just so you have an idea of what to expect, I want to tell you about some of the topics you may be interested in. A big deal right now is a lot of people are working remotely is having everyone on the same page, being able to share information across a team that is all remote or partially remote. And the IntraZone and Microsoft SharePoint are built for this sort of thing. So you can learn a lot more about getting information out to a team, super useful now in 2020. They've also discussed working from home, figuring out an intelligent intranet for your organization, 
And they also did an a episode talking about uh, APIs and how they can give you more tools for teamwork. So go and listen to it now. Just search for the Intra Zone wherever you get your podcasts. That's I N T R A Z O N E, or just click the link in the show notes. Go check it out. Our thanks to Microsoft SharePoint and the Intra Zone for their support of Mac Power users. Let's start with kind of the, the historical, you know, research app on the Mac. And we've given whole shows to it in the past, and that's DevonThink. DevonThink is, you know, got a long history as a native Mac app and active development. You know, it's it's an app you can trust going in. And it's been around for a long time. But the good thing about DevonThink is it's not just sitting on its laurels. Yeah, they've done a good job at keeping it updated. Uh, on the on the Mac, it's got updated UI. It's a really good Mac citizen, so everything you would expect out of a good Mac citizen, like Apple Script and Finder tags. Um, you have a lot of control over where your data lives on your disk, how you sync it. Like it is a um, a really solid, deep, rich Mac app. It is also on iOS and they are working on the iOS app. They've said that's a big focus for them this year. And what I've seen in the betas is very positive. So I'm excited about that. But as I still view it as primarily uh, primarily a Mac app. And that may just may be skewed a little bit by how I work, but on the Mac it is absolutely fantastic. No, I, I think it is. And I want to just linger on that point on the Mac for a minute. Um these guys have full support for Apple script. Like when I use, I use dev and think for, as part of my system. And like, I can click a button on Apple mail and Apple script and email into my dev and think library. So it puts a link back to the, the original email and it can save it. So let's say I have a client project and I want to save all the emails. I collect them in dev and think with one click with an Apple script. It grabs finder tags like if you put a tag a finder tag on a file and put it into devonthink it adds that as a devonthink tag but it also grabs mail tags tags and adds them it's just such a it's such a good player on the mac in terms of anything you throw at it it's going to grab whatever metadata it can and then they built in basically their own version of hazel into devon think this is with the most recent update and historically i was not a huge devon think fan i didn't like the interface and i felt like it was too clunky compared to the finder and then when they i think it's version three that came out about a year and a half two years ago um they made such an improvement that it is a genuinely enjoyable app to run it is no longer clunky it's super efficient it's got end-to-end -end encryption. You can put your own password in so you're fully secure. I mean, there's just so much to like about this app now. Yeah, and I think it's really going to age well once uh, Big Sur shows up. Um, I think that they've done they've done the work in the UI to keep it keep it modern. And I mean, you mentioned Apple Script. One of the one of the ways I get information into dev and think that i really like is that it can check an rss feed for you so i have a a section in dev and think for all of my podcasts so i can search through you know hey when when did we last speak about this on on mac power users for instance and it just crawls the rss feeds and makes a new entry in dev and think for every time there's a new post and so instead of having to okay, it's Sunday, I publish MPU, and then I go to Safari and click the Safari extension to you know scrape it into DevonThink. DevonThink is just doing it for me. It's doing that collection automatically. And and that partnered with AppleScript means like, yeah, you can dump a bunch of manual stuff in DevonThink, and that's how most of my things are there. But it can take a lot of that work off your shoulders as well. Yeah, and they, I, we should have mentioned, they have sponsored us in the past that, you know, so take that as you will. Um, but the, um, now flipping over to the, the iOS version, it's not as good. Um, you've got to sync it over and because of the limitations in the mobile operating system, they can't have the sync just running in the background like it does on the Mac. You've got to have the app open. In fact, one of the uses I have for the new automation in iOS 14 is at 2 AM in the morning, my iPad opens up DevonThink. 
And the whole purpose is so it has a chance to say, oh, Devin Think is awake. Check in and download whatever is changing his database overnight. You know, so when I wake up, it's updated. And I don't, I don't want to have to do that, right? It should be better, but you know, there's limitations they have based on the way Apple, you know, does things. They're not going to let a developer just go hit the internet anytime he wants. Also, the um, the mobile version to me is too slow with some of the text stuff. You know, syncing mm-hmm. text over isn't great, but they're aware of it. You know, I've actually corresponded with the developers and complained about things I don't like in the mobile app, and I they keep hitting with these beta updates. I know that they're I think that they're, you know, they're trying to to bring the the mobile version up to the quality of the Mac one. But, you know, there's work to be done there. Yeah. So let's talk about kind of the four phases, collection, connection, outline, and writing. And collection is where Devin Think is probably the winner of this episode. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can put anything in Devin Think. Files, PDFs, email, text, documents. I mean, what's the craziest stuff you've put in Devin Think? Oh, gosh. You know, I was actually scrolling through here. Um, I have uh, lots. I mean, the majority of what's in here is PDFs. And I use Devin Think's own OCR system, which is incredible. You drop PDFs in there and it, it crawls it. And then you get a little PDF plus text next to it. So you can search text text in it. But yeah, I've got raw HTML files. Like I said, I've got RSS feeds that are being crawled. So those end up being HTML documents. I mean, all sorts of stuff. Uh, it can yeah. take just about anything. And you can have separate vaults. So like I have vaults for areas of law, mm-hmm. you know, because I do research projects and I've got, a, you know, and I just collect research and I put in like, you know, the, we haven't even mentioned that with Devon Think, you can easily grab a web page and drop it into Devon Think. So like when I'm doing research, a lot of times I'll pull cases and things off the internet and drop them into Devon Think. And then, They've got this artificial intelligence system. And the first time I heard about it, I'm like, oh, come on, give me a break. That's marketing, (laughs) you know, whatever. But then the first time I start doing a legal research project and I type in a term and then it gives me a bunch of other suggested documents that it thinks that may give me some additional insight on that term. And there are things that are in my library that I forgot I had or just didn't realize they covered this issue. Like I have... I have all these law review articles I've saved. Well, those are hundreds of pages. I haven't read them all, you know, but Devin think, you know, it, it crawls them for me. And it's like my own, I guess I'd say my own little version of safe Google on my computer, you know? (laughs) So it does the research for me. And I use that not only for legal research, I also use it for some of the elements of Max Sparky, you know, like when I'm working on a new field guide, I collect all my data in there and, and just kind of start working the outline through Dev and Think searches and development. And they also have, you know, annotation tools. So you put a PDF in, you can highlight it and annotate it right in the app. Steven mentioned the, um, already mentioned the OCR engine, but it's a, it's a great OCR engine and it's right there. Yeah. I mean, I have mine set up to automatically OCR PDFs as they go in. Of course, if you have an HTML document, so you, you mentioned you have a web page you want to bring in there, all that's searchable. And the OCR really is, I think it's the best that I've used. I mean, I have, I'm just looking at this. I have hundreds and hundreds of, you know, I have a PDF for every, almost every edition of Macworld magazine, right? Mac user magazine, uh, Mac addict, all these old things. So when I go and look for, you know, coverage of the time of, hey, I want to write about this computer that came out in 2002, I can just search for that and it finds all the text, even in places that I think other OCR systems may fall down, you know, where like the contrast wasn't very good or, you know, the text wasn't perfectly horizontal. We've all kind of seen that over the years. Devin Think just knocks it out of the park. I mean, they they make the sort of searching I need to do across these PDFs possible where no other app did. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. And you just throw things at it, you know, email, PDFs, web pages, and you build this library around it. Now they have organizational tools. They call them groups instead of folders. So you can get as granular and librarian as you want with this, or you can just throw it in a big bucket and it still does the same connections for you. I mentioned earlier, they have their own version of Hazel and and that's exactly what I mean. You can have it search a library for any document, you know, containing 
the term recipsa loquitur and it will tag them for you. You know, it doesn't, whatever it is, weird thing you're working on, um, you can apply that inside your library. Mm -hmm. The other thing that they do with this library in terms of collection, I, I feel like part of a analysis of collections is the ability to share collections. And DevonThink has this rich URL linking system. Uh, this is something that the Apple Finder does not have. Like, so I can put a Word document into a DevonThink client, you know, project. And then I can grab a link for that document out of Dev and Think. It's two clicks, you know. And uh, then I can embed that link anywhere I want. So if I've got an OmniFocus project, I can put the link in the OmniFocus task. So when I hit the OmniFocus task, I click the link, it jumps to Dev and Think and gets me the document, you know. And, you know, so not only is the collection going to accept anything, it's going to share anything, you know. Uh, quite honestly, the reason Evernote didn't get included in this outline is the terrible way you have to share documents out with their weird HTML nonsense, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but Dev and Think is a really good player in that way. And, and also, you can just drag the files out of Dev and Think. I mean, you can literally, if you decide you don't like Dev and Think, just grab your groups, put them on your desktop, and they magically turn into folders. Yeah, I, I've always appreciated that about Dev and Think, that stuff can get get back out really easily. Yeah. So, you know, easy embed, easy collection, easy review. And then they've got the artificial intelligence element and that kind of gets to connections. And so you can draw connections between documents yourself, but when you do a search, it comes up with this fuzzy search that goes through your entire library and finds other things that thinks you may like. And it's really, uh, like I said, I initially was skeptical about it. Now I rely upon it. Yeah, I haven't done too much of that in Dev and Think. Um, I mean, I've, I've done lots of the searching, but I haven't really jumped into what it can do on its own. Uh, and that's sort of my next level with it, I think, as far as like, okay, I have all these source materials, you know, covering 40 years of tech history what can it do to draw these things together in ways that I hadn't seen? Yeah. You can do text files in Dev and Think. You know, you can write text. In fact, uh, our friend Kurosh Dini just published a book about how he's using Zettelcast and, and um, these backlinks in Dev and Think for his kind of knowledge management system. Do you want to go down the rabbit hole of Zettelcast? We have to. I need a good <laughs> definition of this because every time I have looked at this, I think I leave more confused than I was when I started. It, it's really not that hard. Um, it's just a research tool. There was a guy in Austria. I forget his name now, but we'll put a link in the show. There's a Wikipedia article. You can do the deep dive if you want, but I, uh, this is from, I'm not looking at the article. You're not going to hear me reading from Wikipedia on Mac Power Users, but this is the issue, right? When you research, you have random ideas. You know, we talked a little bit recently about, you know, when I read a book, how I export highlights and then try to summarize highlights. I mean, it's something I've been doing my whole life. And this, uh, I think he was a social scientist, was doing the same thing with note cards. So he would have a note card with a single idea on it. And he had a very fancy, um, indexing system. And every time he'd see something in a book or uh, in a lecture that reminded him of that idea, reinforced it or argued with it, he would make a note on the note card. So then he could pull the note cards out and he could organize them to, you know, to construct ideas, hypotheses, and it helped this guy write a lot of books. All right. That that's a very simple version. People that are really into this are going to be listening and be very angry with me, but that, <laughs> that's kind of how it works. Um, so obviously bringing this to the digital age, um, you can do this in a much easier way that doesn't require a fancy index system or a bunch of boxes of note cards, you know, and, um, the text files in Dev and Think can absolutely act as those note cards, right? The things you really need for that to work is the ability to write text down, and to reference it to your research, which in DevonThink's case, a lot of times the source documents are already in your DevonThink library with those cool URL links. And you need the ability to create links between individual notes. So there's two ways to do that. The first is 
say, I'm going to put a pointer in note card A or digital note card A that points at digital note card B. But what where the payoff of this really works is what is called backlinks. And backlinks are, I want to go in digital note card B and know everything that points at it. All right. So if you make a link from card A to card B, that doesn't generally create a link from card B to card A. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's not that hard of a concept, you know, but usually these digital pointers go one direction. But a backlink is a program-based way to um, to automatically know if I look at card B that card A is looking at it. And I want to look at all the card A's that are looking at it. So suddenly, your the value of these individual note cards is much higher because you can see everything that points at it. I was talking earlier about this whole Stoicism, Buddhism thing. It was just like concepts I was writing down about, you know, staying in the moment and not getting hung up on what other people think and just kind of basic little like ideas that come out of these, these studies. And then all of a sudden you realize that are, there are two entirely different schools of thought that point at the same idea. And that is Zettelkasten. You know, it's the idea of being able to make these little ideas and have pointers at them. How's that? Did I get you there? Yeah, I think that's the most concise thing I've heard about it. Uh, I guess, I mean, it, is it hard to, I mean, I guess I don't work this way. Let me say that up front. But I would imagine that it would be hard to, could be hard to know, like, what is one piece of information? Like, what is one text file or one index card? I guess you have kind of have to fill that out. It's up to you. It's yeah. up to you, man. That's it. I mean, for you, it could be that, you know, the amount of RAM... And a Mac is always more expensive <laughs> than it is on the market. You know, I don't know. But the uh, uh, it's just, you know, it's just a way of if you're going to go on these kind of little intellectual explorations, what are you going to take out of it? You know, mm-hmm. let's say you watch a YouTube video about a topic you're interested in or you read a book about it. Once you're done watching the video or reading the book, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to, did you individually get some takeaways out of it? And it, it could be, you know, I, I wish I hadn't talked about Buddhism and Stoicism because people get hung up when I talk about religion. But let's say it was about mathematics or history or sociology or whatever. You take something from these things, right? You learn a little something, you write it down. And then suddenly you start seeing it in other places. And then you just make pointers at it from other places. And maybe you see a lot of pointers at it and you realize, hey, you know what? This is something that is a common thread in my life. How can I use this to make myself better? Or how can I use this to work on my PhD paper or whatever? Um, And this just gives you a digital system to track all that stuff. Okay. You don't have to do it. Not everybody has to do it. I I mean, I don't do it with every element of my life, but there are certain things that I work on, like legal research is one of them. I work in a fairly particular area of law. Right. There are a bunch of principles and ideas that I've kind of boiled down to simple thoughts, and I have resources and authorities that point at them. Um, when I'm working on a field guide about paperless, I've been collecting ideas and thoughts on paperless for 15 years. So I've got all these notes and PDFs and different things. And when I decide something, I want to use it, or I think this is an area worth pursuing. Then I look at what is my research on this and where does it work? Where does it doesn't work? So, you know, you just pick the areas of your life. Some people are really into it in terms of their spiritual life. Like uh, Mike Schmidt's, um, over at the Focus Podcast, he uh, mind maps his weekly sermons, you know, that he goes to, and then he collects that data and then he draws connections with it and it's helping him spiritually. I mean, so there, there are a lot of different ways you can use this data, but the thing we're talking about today is, well, here's the tools you can do that with and what you decide to do with it, that's up to you. So, uh, getting back to Devin Think, um, it's got the ability to create these notes. It's got the cre- ability to create backlinks. The backlinks aren't that friendly. Um, it, you know, it's a little time intensive to set them up. Um, Kurash's book uh, does a good job of explaining how he uses Keyboard Maestro to automate a bunch of that stuff. So he's he, and he has the beauty of a, sis, a single app system. You know, maybe next time we have him to show up and talk about this, but he's got his Zettelkasten cards and all his research and everything in Devon Think. 
And in a lot of ways, that's the win, right? Mm-hmm. But I couldn't stop there. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot more apps to talk about. Uh. <laughs> this episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Hover. Go to hover.com slash MPU and make a name for yourself. Get 10% off any domain name. Hover is one of the longest running sponsors of the Mac Power Users. So when you have that one big idea, where do you go? Well, your business starts with a domain name. So for many entrepreneurs, Hover is that big leap. And Hover makes that leap so simple. You just go to hover.com slash MPU. You type in the name of the domain you want and you buy it. That's what I did for both MaxSparky.com and SparkCSQ.com, the two domains that run my life. In both cases, the process of buying was simple and liberating. It feels so good when you own your own domain, and Hover makes that possible for you. Hover has over 300 domain name extensions to choose from, so no matter what you want to build, there's a domain name waiting for it. And they have excellent technical support to answer any questions you may have, And they're dedicated to getting you online, not upselling you with a bunch of services you don't need. .inc is a new premium domain extension for businesses that want to be taken seriously. Have you checked if your brand name is currently available for purchase to the public? Don't let someone else beat you to your brand's .inc domain. From small startups to large enterprises, brands are taking notice of the credibility of the .inc domain. Over 56% of Forbes' most valuable brands are registered, including PayPal, Facebook, Fox, Amazon, and Walmart. Hover has free who is privacy, so the bad guys don't get your information, a clean user interface, and monthly sales on popular top-level domains. It's easy to see why Hover is the popular choice for people starting businesses. Millions of company names end with INC, and now your domain name can too. Upgrade your domain to the perfect match. Join over 56% of Forbes' most valuable brands and register your .inc domain today. Go to hover.com slash MPU and get a 10% discount on all new purchases. The URL, one more time, is hover.com slash MPU. Make a name for yourself with Hover. Our thanks to Hover for their support of the Mac Power users and all of RelayFM. Uh, So up next we have the app, the Mac app Tinderbox, which is another one of these long-term Mac apps. I think they're up to version like 8.8, been around a long time. Uh, very mature feature set like Devin. Think I, I kind of think of these things as as peers in a weird way. Yeah, they are because they're. I think they're very complementary of one another. Um, Tinderbox is heavier on the, you know, combine my thinking side than the collect resources side you know like devon thing accepts all these different types of data in it and draws connection between them tinderbox really is more of a here is a thread of an idea and how do i follow that through backlinks are much easier with the tinderbox and but but it also is like you said a mac app through and through it has apple script support you know it is you know it's fast it's a mac app you know i mean That means a lot because some of the apps we're going to talk about later aren't Mac apps and that there's all sorts of prices and uh, consequences as a result of that. Collection in Tinderbox is different than Devon Think, Um, but, you know, it's not so much as a database, but it can work with the Devon Think database. So like I talked earlier about the URL links in Devon Think, you can start a thread of an idea in Tinderbox, and you can link it to Dev and Think documents because they're both Mac apps and they both have these URL links. How do you feel that uh, that Tinderbox does in terms of doing work for you? We talked about how Dev and Think can can do can automate a lot of the import, and a lot of these apps and services can work on connections. How does Tinderbox hold up there? I mean, it really is, it does work for you, but in a different way and kind of in a different context. Like a lot of the people that I've bumped into that are heavy Tinderbox users are academics because it's, you know, academics, I talked about reading and comparing and collecting thoughts. Academics do that all day long. That's their job. So they have a much bigger library of data to deal with than I do. And Tinderbox it really is kind of an architecture tool 
in the sense that with Tinderbox, you can create any kind of framework you want to collect these ideas. Like maybe you want to collect the research and thoughts around general concepts. You know, you're studying history and you want to do it around a specific period of time, you know, the pre-Civil War U.S. economy or something. So you can have Tinderbox build around that idea. Alternatively, you could build Tinderbox around all of the people who have historically written and thought about the pre-Civil War U.S. economy. And then you co- and then you, from there, you can collect everything they've written and look for threads between them that make different connections. So it, it, Tinderbox very much is a user-generated um, system of thinking. You know, the, one of the, the thoughts that gets tossed around a lot in this community is an external brain. You know, the idea of an external mm-hmm. brain. In fact, I think, didn't Devin think use that as a marketing term at once, at one point? I don't know if they Them still Them or were. Evernote, maybe. Uh, maybe maybe it was Evernote. I don't, I don't remember. And then, like, you know, um, Tiago Forte has this whole course about building your second brain. And, you know, the, the idea is that, you know, humans are really good at working on connections, but we're not good at holding on to a lot of data. You know, we just weren't kind of, we didn't evolve that way. Mm-hmm. So the idea of these apps is you put everything in there and you let that be the place that holds that stuff. And then you go in there to make the connections. Well, with Tinderbox, you can use your brain to like set up the structure of how this stuff connects together and then see what happens. And there are a lot of, I didn't, I didn't, I haven't used Tinderbox as heavily as some of these other apps um, because I don't do academic research, but if you start like talking to people and looking into it, there are some really remarkable academic work being done out of Tinderbox. Yeah, looking through their website, one thing I like about how they show off their application is giving a lot of like real use examples. And there's you know writing, scientific writing. Someone planned an entire novel, like did all of their story mapping and everything. In Tinderbox, I mean, all of these apps can be shaped to what you want them to be, but I found that to be a useful way to think about uh, what these sorts of tools can do once you get your data in there. Yeah, and they, you know, because you kind of design your own user interface around your research, it gives you a whole bunch of tools for that. I mean, they allow you to make maps of your data and if you look at the website, I think it's a little misleading because there are some very complicated maps demonstrated on the website. And the experimentation I did was with smaller maps. Things like one of the things I was trying to figure out is how can I get more efficient at you know the workflows of some of the stuff I'm producing? And I started putting together ideas and thoughts on that. And I started building that out in Tinderbox. And I was able to come up with some nice ideas that weren't nearly so complex as the examples. But, you know, this is definitely a big boy tool for research. And, you know, the price reflects it. It's $250. But honestly, in comparison to some of the other apps we're going to talk about, that's in the ballpark. And Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people doing a lot of heavy research with this. Now, I think it's good for collecting and connecting. I think, once again, this is the wheelhouse of Tinderbox. Um, they added a feature recently called filtered outlines where you can start putting together outlines and filter based on tags and other like information. And I think that's really clever, but it's really not the place that you do the writing in. You know, I think Tinder bu- Tinderbox is the development of ideas. Writing is done somewhere else. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And in fact, that's kind of how I feel about it. Um... The apps we've covered so far, I feel that way about Devon Think too. Just because I can write in it doesn't mean that I necessarily want to. Yeah, and that that kind of brings us to the next um, one I wanted to talk about, and that's the archive. And um, talk about embracing Zettelcast, and their website is zettelcastin dot de. You know, <laughs> they just went for it. <laughs> yeah, they you know. But the well, it actually goes a little deeper than that. I mean, the website goes deeper into Zettelcast, and the archive is a tool they kind of developed to help along with the process. And this was the first time I'd seen someone put it into software. The app's a few years old now, but I mean, it's it's kind of come a long way in terms of that. Again, it's a Mac app, so it it's a you know native app on the Mac that's a good player. 
Um, it uses Zettelcast and links, coded links to connect between ideas. So this really is the most genuine uh, digital embodiment of the Zettelcast system. So if you read about Zettelcast and it's pushing your buttons, I think the archive is an app you need to take a look at. And the thing I like about the archive, in addition to kind of its Zettelcast and roots, is that it works on markdown files. And this app is not the big collection app like Dev and Think, but it is the, it is one that gives you writing options because everything is a markdown file. It reminds me very much of Envy Alt or something like that, but with this extra layer on top of it of all of this inner note linking. Yeah. Uh, I do I do like this approach, though, of you can just have a pile of markdown documents somewhere. That's one reason I like the way Devin thinks stores things, because I know I have a bunch of PDFs and HTML f- files on my SSD that I can go get if I need to. Uh, so I do appreciate this sort of minimal, clean approach as opposed to having everything, you know, like an Apple Notes in this database that if something goes sideways, I can't necessarily get my data out of it very easily. Yeah, what you said as an extra layer on top of Markdown is really exactly what this is and, and what is the advantage of it because you have Markdown files. We did a show on Markdown just a few months ago. Markdown files are text files. Mm -hmm. They're the ultimate in portability. They're super small, so synchronization or or parsing this library is wicked fast because it's just text files. And you can, if the app, if you decide you don't like the app, you just take your collection of Markdown files. You lose the, the toolkit that was on top of it because you're not using the app anymore, but you didn't lose any of your data. Yeah, and that's important if you have you know, something like years of information or something. It may not be that you even found something you like better. Maybe you did. Maybe it's just the developer moved on. There's all sorts of reasons that software comes and goes over the years. And we're talking about, like for me, like my Mac, Apple tech history library, I've been building for 10 years. It's been a Devon thing for the last year, but I've been assembling that for a really long time. And so thinking about longevity is like, it's always in the back of my mind. Yeah. Well, I mean, with Devin think you could get that stuff out just yep. by copying it out. And just like if you were doing writing in the archive, you could do the same thing. I mean, and that is the, uh, the point. It also, it's, you know, this one has a low barrier of entry. It's $20. Like I said, if you're interested in Zettelcast, and this might be a good jumping off point because it really gives you that kind of grounding in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you want to do writing as part of your research, again, this is the first one that really accommodates that. I guess yeah. I, I could argue that DevonThink could also be a writing platform, but I've never had a good experience with that with DevonThink. Although that may change, you know. Um, one of the th- like we said at the top of the show, this this space is moving so fast right now. It is is so exciting uh, as a user to see these apps just like duking it out right now with this explosion of features and functionality. Mm -hmm. This episode of Mac power users is brought to you by one password. Go to onepasswordcom slash MPU MPU in all caps to learn more, sign up for a free 30 day trial. And when you do sign up, you'll get 20% off. Look, we all know those people maybe friends or family or coworkers who keep their passwords in a paper notebook or they have a bunch of sticky notes. That is not the way to live in 2020. 1Password gives you access to all of your credentials, including things like two-factor authentication codes, secure notes, bank account information, debit card information. All of that data can be with you wherever you go securely. 1Password takes this stuff really seriously. That means they're always on top of the latest security information that's out there, always integrating with new system features. So things like face ID and touch ID and password autofill, all of that works as you would expect. One thing that 1Password is doing right now between October 12th and November 26th is they're donating a dollar to charity for every family that signs up for 1Password. They're giving this to uh, a bunch of great places, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Canada, Food Banks Canada, and the Canadian Mental Health Association. A lot of people are having a hard time in 2020, and one password wants to make the world a better place. I love this initiative. 
One password for families is really cool. You can have shared logins between you and your significant other. Your kids have them all in separate vaults. It's fantastic. So to learn more and to sign up, go to onepassword.com slash MPU. to get a free 30-day trial. When you sign up, you'll get 20% off. Our thanks to 1Password for not only sponsoring the show, but for making this year a little brighter. All right, so let's talk about Rome Research for a little bit. Okay. Um, we did mention it on our notes app, and that was fairly early kind of in my exploration of Rome. Um, this is an app that came out late last year, but just recently has kind of exploded. They, they, they started and then they had to close the beta because they had too many people signing up. This is a text-based app. It definitely has Zettelkasten and roots in it. And I talked earlier about the advantages of links, you know, and backlinks. And the thing that makes Rome a special snowflake is that it does backlinks in the most, um, the easiest way I've ever seen, you know? So if you're writing in a document, you just put two brackets around a term and you just created a link. And that in essence creates a separate page for that link. Now this is, you can do the same thing kind of in Tinderbox. So don't write me if you're a Tinderbox fan, you know, I, I get it. But the, uh, but Rome just really felt to me like it was one of the most, you know, the most non-friction ways of doing this. So imagine that you're writing about, you know, pre-Civil War economy and you come across a, an influential person of the time that you want to have a reference to. And his name is um, Heaven Sackett, right? So you uh, you write mm, Heaven Sackett. That guy sounds handsome and trustworthy. There he is, right? And then you just put two brackets around it. And then you just created a page called Stephen Hackett. And that page, if you go to that page, at the bottom is going to be backlinks that refer to that page. And that reference you just made to that person is there. All automatically? Automatically. No, because I put it in two brackets, it is a direct link. But what's even more interesting is it searches the entire database at the same time to say, oh, Stephen Hackett's name also appeared on this other page where you had, you know, a newspaper abstract from the time or another page where you had read a book and it had his name as author. So there are all these other links to him. Would you like me to also connect those to this page? And you say, yes. And now you've just created a link to everything that has that name on it. And you can go back and look at it anytime you want. And as you continue to work, you can, that builds itself automatically for you. These backlinks just appear automatically. And then maybe you start thinking about some things in particular to this guy. So you go to that page and you write some notes on him on that page, you know, but you also have all those backlinks at the bottom. So then six months later, you come across the name Stephen Hack or ha what? Heaven Sackett. Yes. <laughs> what did I do to myself here? I don't know. But anyway, um, so you see that link again, you're like, oh, what was it about that guy? And you click on it and it jumps to that page and it's got the notes you took on him and shows you all the backlinks. And you say, oh, that kind of reminds me of that thing I was working on six months ago. Well, there it is right there in the backlink to this person so I can click on it. And suddenly you start jumping around this library and it's crazy how, first of all, how easy it is to create these links and how wicked useful they become. Yeah, I can, I can see how the the automatic linking would be critical as your library grows. And uh, I don't, I, this is the one that I don't have firsthand experience with. So I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on you here, but I would imagine that in some of the other systems that can become sort of a job unto itself, whereas Rome just takes care of it for you. Yes. And it, it's just ridiculously fast. And like the unlinked references, the idea of unlinked references and then it very quickly becomes something that a nerd like me says, oh, well, I, if I can do this with this tool, what else can I do with the tool, right? So then you start thinking, like, when you start using Rome, it gives you, the first page you see is just a daily page. Every day it gives you a new blank page, right? So not only do I see my backlinks, I see the days that I did the backlinks on, so I can look at things chronologically. And then, so people start putting together 
like their daily log, almost like a diary system in Rome. And I played with that a little bit, right? So I'm like, okay, like one of my usual prompts every day is gratitude. You know, every day, every morning I write something I'm thankful for. I know a bunch of people are rolling their eyes right now, but it actually helps me get my day started. So, so I did that, you know, and it's, what am I thankful for today? So I have that written down. And I did that for a couple of days in Rome. Then I realized, well, what if I turned the question, what am I grateful for today into a page? So I put two brackets around it. And now I have a backlink for what am I grateful for? So not only do I have it down on each daily page, if I go to the page that it links to, it's got a list of what I wrote down every day for as many days as I use this tool, right? It's just like crazy little things you can start linking together in this environment where everything links to something else. And it does get crazy. I mean, if you go on YouTube and search Rome Research, people have like turned their whole like life into a Rome database. They call it a graph in Rome, but you know, it's a database. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually kind of the road to madness, honestly. (laughs) Um, You know, so like people have like, they built their task management system and they built, and before you know it, you look at the stuff they're doing, they're like, okay, so what they have is an inferior system to everything I do. My calendar system better, my task system is better, but they do have these cool links where everything links together. And that to them is more valuable than having really like a an actual task system, mm-hmm. you know, and I think it, I think it can get a little crazy, but I think, but for, you know, getting back to where we started with this show research and connecting ideas, I think they're really onto something. And what Rome does that really makes this interesting is that they are so granular with these links that everything in Rome is in essence, what you would call a block or a thought. I mean, it, the app is a big outline. Everything you do is basically an outline and every outline point is linkable. So like if you have a book you've read and you've got, you know, let's say 72 entries about the book, little thoughts you wrote down or quotes from the book, every single one of those things is linkable. So uh, the to link a thought inside your Rome database, uh, there's square brackets to create a page or or just parentheses to reference something that exists. So you put two parentheses and you start typing the first couple words of any sentence that's referenced in a book. And you can get a link to that very specific sentence inside your research. And you kind of, this is kind of hard to describe over the air, but my point is anything links to anything else, anything, you know, not just the titles, not just the headings, the whole enchilada is linkable. Mm -hmm. And that is crazy. That is so crazy that you can build this database out and link anything to anything else. And then you follow these threads, you know, you follow the breadcrumbs, you click on the link to that book and that book you see was linked in 17 other posts and you follow that. And suddenly you're jumping around and you are, you know, the serendipity is being programmed and it works. Now, I've told you the good parts mm-hmm. <laughs> about Rome. I want to talk about some things about it that make it weird, right? Okay. It's a web app. Yeah. It is not a Mac app. It is a website that you go to, romeresearch.com or whatever the link is. Uh, and you sign in, and to use the app, you log in to the web. You know, you open your browser, you go to their website. If your internet is down, you don't have access to your data. It's a web app that uses a lot of resources. Like using my my Mac laptop in Rome in Safari, my Mac gets hot. Wow. My battery life gets shorter. <laughs> I mean, and my Rome research library is not huge because I, you know, I I'm in testing mode with these things more than I'm in daily use mode. But uh I do have a yeah, I have, I have a lot of data in there because I pulled all of my um my Readwise quotes. And like one of the things they do is Rome connects because it's a web app. There's a hook from Readwise, that app I talked about that collects all my Kindle highlights. Yeah. It just, it just moves them in every night. I wake up in the day. Like if I, if I go to bed and read an Instapaper article and highlight a couple things, the next day, those highlights are in my Rome research database, you know? Yeah, it's cool. So it's a web app in the good ways, but it's also a web app in the bad ways. You know, it's a web app. It works on the iPad, sort of. You know, not entirely. There are things that, that don't seem to work that well in the mobile Safari. Like copy and paste is one where you've got, you can copy and paste, but 
you can't just hit command C. You've got to right click and then kind of use the internal web interface. Mm -hmm. Good things about web apps is that they change often. And almost weekly, we get these emails from Bro because I've, I've paid for it. You know, I've been testing it um, as we been working towards this show and weekly i get these emails with oh, this is all the stuff we did to improve your quality of life in row and weekly it is getting better they just received an eight million dollar investment Whoa. with a with a 200 million dollar capitalization so people think the companies were 200 million that makes this web service the, i when i read that i'm like wow one of two things could happen you know, they could take that $8 million and turn this into an even better app. You know, they could really make this, or they could take that $8 million and they could, you know, Evernote this thing into a piece of garbage, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. You know, like Evernote sure. was great. And then they tried to make it more rather than try and make it better at what it does. They tried to make it more. And then, you know, things got really weird. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen with Rome, but they suddenly have a bunch of money so they could hire a lot of smart programmers. And hopefully the people in charge are working on the fundamentals of the app. Um, Rome research has been massively adopted in academia. There are tons of people working on PhD stuff using Rome research because of the beauty of these backlinks, right? It just makes it so easy to collect your data. Uh, it's web based. You can embed a markdown URL links. It uses markdown. So you can have a dev and think database on your Mac and you can do a bunch of Rome backlinking on text, but then have it put a markdown link to your dev and think library to get to the document that you were using. So all this stuff kind of talks to itself, talks to each other. The big caveat for me and the reason why I wasn't able to test it as deep as I wanted um, was the security model. Um, right now, Rome is an app where your security is your username, which is an email. Not, not super hard to guess people's email. No. And then a password. And that is it. There's no two-factor authentication. There's no end-to-end -end encryption. And everything is on the web. That's not quite enough for me. Uh, yeah. And I would imagine that's not enough for people who have, you know, like you do, sensitive work information. Yeah, it's just, it's not enough. I mean, I, I actually got into a Twitter exchange with the uh, Rome's founder. We'll put a link to the show notes where he says, no, we're looking at end-to-end -end encryption. You know, that's, on, I think, I think he implied it's on the roadmap. He didn't really say explicitly. I also started a thread in their forums that got a lot of other cranky people like me saying, what are you guys doing about this? And they, they mm -hmm. really haven't, they really haven't answered the question to tell you the truth, <laughs> but even like two factor authentication, man. Yeah. It's, that's pretty easy to implement this, this day and age. Yeah. So, so anyway, and, and they have access to the data. I mean, so anything you put in the room, they can read. Now they've said, we aren't going to read it. We don't want to. And I actually believe them. I don't think that's really in their interest. Yeah, but they could, you know, so that that makes me super uncomfortable. Um, sure. The cost is fifteen dollars a month, or one sixty five a year, or they have a thing where you pay five hundred dollars. You're in for five years. They, um, it's not cheap. It's super powerful. It's not cheap. Um, they also have a bunch of weird features, like you know, because it's a web app, they just keep bolting on stuff. Like it's got the ability to start a Pomodoro timer. Or you can create a Kanban board, you know, those boards where you can like move projects yeah. across. Sure. Uh, they, they have date selectors. They, they have so many tools because people are using Rome to do so much. They're building these extra tools. And I, I like that they're doing that and it makes it more useful for the users. But fundamentally, they've nailed what Rome is about to me, which is linking and backlinking with zero friction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that is one upside of being a web app, right? They can add those things without having to wait for app store approval or, you know, any of those things. But for me, the online only is a, that's pretty close to a deal breaker, I think. Yeah, no, I, I think ultimately it is for me too. And uh, I'm watching what they're doing, like, but there's so many reasons to like the app. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I learn a lot from YouTube. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm weird that way. I don't watch the dogs on skateboards so much, but there are lots of intellectual things I'm interested in. Sometimes it's tech research for the show. Sometimes it's something completely out, out in the field. But whatever it is, there are 
usually some quality YouTube content on it. So uh, Rome has the ability, you just type slash you, you know, and then it creates a YouTube link mechanism and you paste in your YouTube and it embeds that YouTube video into your Rome graph. And so you set up a page about whatever this video is, and then you can take notes on the video with the video embedded right above it. That's cool. Just, you know, it's like cool stuff like that. Right. And mm -hmm. so all that stuff just keeps coming to Rome and everything is searchable and linkable again, even down to this granular block level. And that is why so many people love Rome. But to me, the security model um, and to a lesser extent, the web only model are the reason why I'm just not sold on it right now, you know? Yeah. Um, and maybe they'll get better at that, but those are big problems for me. I mean, it, it is web-based data store. I could see them building native apps that tap into that data. People have done stuff like that before and they sure. have a bunch of big pile of money right now. Yeah, I mean, I, say, I feel turn like that money into applications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and security, and I mean, they could, and I'm sure there are smart people there arguing for that, but yeah, but the um, but that's what they need to do, and this stuff is so early days that you know, a year from now, I could be doing a whole show on Rome Research talking about how I use it and how I love it, and I'm totally sold on it. Mm -hmm. I'm just not there at this moment because sure. of these limitations. Now, getting to the kind of the outlining and writing bit, yes, the outlining is amazing in Rome as a web tool, you outline anything, you hit a tab key, you indent things. It's got a great way of displaying it. Everything is foldable. It is not on the outliner. I mean, Omni outliner <laughs> is a much better outliner than this, Yeah, but it, it is a good quality outliner that has amazing link, you know, links built into it. So I feel like they got the mix right for that. I would never write anything of long form or something that I wanted to publish in Rome, you know, you know, the first rule of writing is never write on the web, right? Yep. Don't write in the browser. <laughs> Don't yeah. do it. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, I mean, maybe Rome has a great backend, but, you know, a bad internet connect. There's a lot of reasons why that's just a bad idea. So I, I, I played around with it and I know there are people who are writing in Rome. Um, you know, I wish them Godspeed, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but I feel like they're in, there are sharks in those waters, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, um, so, so it's great for outlining. It's not so great for writing. Um, the, the community around Rome has a bad reputation. The, the, the people behind Rome named it hashtag Rome cult, which I think was a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is a huge turnoff for me when I, yeah. in fact, when I first heard of the app and I heard that there, you know, the Rome cult, it reminded me of the early days of, getting things done and why I was so resistant to that because everybody, it was, it felt like a cult mm -hmm. anyway. So I went in, I, you know, I'm a paying member now. So I go in, I've got access to the forums. It's not like that at all. People are nice in there. They're trying to help each other out. I, it was very bad naming in my opinion, but you know, the people around Rome are trying to help other people. And it's, it's, it's largely a lot of academic people trying to help each other figure things out. And, um, it's a good, it's a good group of people that, you know, want to make it better. So don't let the uh, the whole Rome cult thing chase you away. Um, and I think that, like I said earlier, I think people are taking this thing to kind of extreme levels. They're doing their diary in it. I mean, I don't want to do my diary in a web app with no end-to-end -end encryption. You know, day one is still pretty good, right? Um, task management, project planning, you name it, folks are doing it. And uh, it feels to me like that is a little crazy. But the thing that I talked about, Rome, the, the, uh, the focus of today's show is research. And Rome is something you should be aware of and maybe something you want to poke around with. Um, to me, my relationship with Rome at this point is I'm watching carefully their updates, but I'm not putting any data into it. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair given what you've said about it. And I think a lot of people in our community would rather have a native app or at least something closer to it than a tab in Safari. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Text Expander. Take your time back with the power of Text Expander. Just go to textexpander.com slash podcasts to learn more and sign up. Repetitive typing, little mistakes, and searching for answers, they're all taking precious time away from you and your team. 
With Text Expander, you can take it back. The latest version of Text Expander even has new and improved statistics reporting for organizations, including the ability to build reports with customizable date ranges for enterprises and individuals so you can track how much time your team saves. Put Text Expander in place at your workplace and use these tools to show your boss how smart you are and how much time you're saving everyone. With Text Expander, you can keep your team consistent, accurate, and current. Share your current text and images with the whole staff to keep them on track, and everyone will share the same message and give the same answers to all customer questions. You can also work faster and smarter using Text Expander's powerful shortcuts and abbreviations to streamline and speed up everything you type. Text Expander is a tool that makes it easy to create powerful snippets to save you time, so you can just type that short abbreviation and let Text Expander do the rest of the work for you and keep your whole team communicating efficiently and with a consistent language. You can even share your snippets of messaging, signatures, and descriptions with everyone who works on projects with you. One of the things I didn't mention in today's episode is how often I'm using Text Expander with these research tools, because often I'll want to insert some metadata about what it is I'm recording. What's the date the book was written? Who's the author? All that stuff can be done with Text Expander snippets. And best of all, Text Expander is available on the Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Just go to textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander and let them know you heard about it on the Mac Power Users. All right, so the, the next one here on the list is Obsidian, which I, I in some ways find maybe the most interesting. Um uh, because of it is not it's not an outliner it's it's a markdown writing app but they have a lot of these other ideas in here uh and it's a really small development team which i always love i like apps that are handcrafted by a handful of people who take feedback from their users yeah so this show has this particular episode has been in planning for a long time because i knew i wanted to cover it but i wanted to do it justice mm mm-hmm. mhm and I downloaded Obsidian. I'm looking at my uh, my log now about nine nine weeks ago. Okay. And thinking that this is a box I need to check off. I need to get through this app so I can talk about it, but there's no way I'm going to use an app that's that's an, an Electron app. It's an Electron app, you know, <laughs> right? And I'm like, well, I'll just check it off. And this Obsidian, Stephen, this Obsidian is on my computer. I am using it every day now. <laughs> yeah, so it is it is pretty new, right? Like it's a young app. How does that yes. compare to something that's been around a lot longer? I, I, I need to talk to somebody. I know it's a very small development team. Looking in their forums, I think it's two people, but I'm not really sure. Uh, and I, I have to guess they were inspired by Rome and the way it took off because – um, Obsidian has a lot of the similar concepts of Rome, but it's built on an entirely different model. You know, Rome is an online outline where every basically sentence or node is a unit. Obsidian works. It's, it's a layer on top of a folder full of markdown files. So it, they're very different and yet they, they do similar things. So you're right. It, it's, it's built out as an electron app, which means it, it can go into different platforms. People are using it on Windows, and I think there's even a Unix version for. I don't really. I, I haven't really gone down the stack on that. I know it's on the Mac, right? So yeah. there we go. And it's it's Electron, so it's going to use way more RAM than any other normal Mac app would. Mm-hmm. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it doesn't feel like it. every Electron app I've used feels like an Electron app. You know, it feels like something that doesn't even really belong on the Mac, right? Sure. Let, let's say Slack. <laughs> Slack's an Electron app, right? It is. It doesn't feel like a Mac app to me. It feels like a web view, you know? Yeah. Uh, this app is not like that. It, it feels like a Mac app. And if you hit command comma, it opens up the preferences and you can make custom keyboard shortcuts. And the uh, And they've got this small development team, but just like Rome, we're getting weekly updates out of this thing, and it is crazy how much progress they've made in this very short time. So with Obsidian, 
like um, the archive, you can have this folder full of markdown folders. And Obsidian is like a layer on top of it. So you open Obsidian and you say, where, where's my vault? They call it a vault as well. Well, you point it at a folder. You either create one or you point it at one. And inside that, you've got markdown files. And it's just a markdown notes editor at that level, right? But um, with Obsidian, you can then start making links. And they use the same double bracket you know, mechanism that Rome does. And it does the same thing. Once I create a link, then I have a backlink. So if I, you know, put two links around your name and then go to another file, then I'll see it. If I, if I click on your name and two sets of brackets and a page doesn't, a markdown file doesn't exist already on you, it will create one for you. And so I can go into that and there is a backlinks tab. You click on the backlinks and I see every page in this library that references your name. So you get that same backlinking goodness that you get with Rome, but instead of having a web service, you've got it on a collection of markdown files. One thing that I think sets Obsidian apart too is its plugin architecture. So if if you want a piece of functionality that it doesn't have, there are a little over 20 official plugins and they have documentation uh, so people can write their own eventually. And I think that's great if you do if you do want additional functionality, but you don't want your app to be clogged up with a bunch of stuff you don't need. Uh, Obsidian is is unique in that just about. Yeah. And if you're going through the preferences, it's just a bunch of check boxes. You say, I want this feature. Like one of them is you can save audio notes. Mm -hmm. Like I want to save audio notes to this page. Well, you can turn that on or turn it off. I've turned it off. I don't want to deal with that. I mean, I look at this as a text, a text monster. I don't want to put audio in it, um, but it's there and people are creating plugins, but getting back to the links before we move on. Sure. In addition with obsidian, you can link not only will it link to pages, like like if I use your name, then there would be a page based on your name. You can also link to markdown headings. We talked in the markdown show about how like, you know, you have the the pound sign and you can have up to in the obsidian, I think you have up to six of them. So you have six levels of headings. So if I go to create a link to a different page, I once I I make the two brackets, it auto fills for me, which is great. And Rome does this too because you want to make sure you get the right, you know, link. But then once it picks the page for me, I can hit the pound sign again and it'll then give me a list of all the headings on that page so I can link to a specific heading. That's not as good as block links in Rome. Rome can link right down to the individual sentence, but this gets close enough, you mm -hmm. know, and it's only with markdowns. And on the Obsidian roadmap, they have that they are working on a block link system, which I don't know how they're going to do that with markdown, but I'll be very curious to see how they how they pull that off. But they keep delivering, so I, I suspect they have figured it out. But either way, so it doesn't do block links yet, but it can do heading links. And so you get that linking kind of serendipitous knowledge with it. And another thing, big piece of Obsidian, and this is true with Rome as well, but I think Obsidian does a better job of it, is a graph of this knowledge. And it it's hard to explain. You have to see it. I, I put a copy of mine in the show. I guess we can put it in the show notes. There's nothing secret in there right now, but Steven, are you looking at that screenshot I gave you? Yes. Yeah. Like it's weird looking, right? It, it is weird looking. So like I said, it'll be in the notes, but you have, I mean, it looks like a web. So you have these nodes that are connected to each other. Some more than others. You have some that aren't linked at all. Yeah. And I assume these are, this is a visualization of your bits of information in Obsidian that are linked together. Yeah, it's, it's each dot is one of my markdown files. Okay. And it shows where they're connected and where they're not. And I can, and I can filter this based on tags and other things. So I can say, give me each one of these dots that has the active tag next to it. And it's going to get me a list of all the markdown files that I have on active projects and show how they're connected or Give me one that has every one that has, you know, pre-Civil War economy attached to it. And then it's going to show you how they connect together. So you can, this is kind of the macro view of the, of it as I'm using it, but you can get in very detailed and jump around in it, which I find 
kind of fascinating. At first, I thought it was just a, um, a attack on that had no use, but now I do find myself navigating around this map and finding things. You know, once again, digital serendipity, and so that's that's really cool too. But it is an app that has a small development team, and I worry about that for the exact opposite of the reasons that, that I worry about Rome getting eight million dollars. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This kind of concerns on both ends of that, right? That if it's just a yeah. couple of people, you know, what happens if it doesn't work out or they need to move on for whatever reason? Yeah. And, and the way they, um, they're monetizing obsidian at this point is you can like just voluntarily give them some money. I did that. And then they put me on their, their beta feed basically, you know, so I get the early releases of their new mm-hmm. features um, if you're going to use it commercially, there's going to be a $50 a year license, but they also have a free model. I mean, you can download obsidian and start using it for free right now. And they're doing some tack on stuff. Like they have a way to publish your obsidian graph, which to me, this is all the exact opposite of stuff I want to publish, but you know, maybe you've got something you're working on. You want to share on the internet, you can publish it. You pay an additional fee for that. They've also got, a, it's not public yet, but they have an end-to-end encryption model where they, where they will sync the files for you and do it on an end-to-end encrypted basis. And I think that last I read, I think it was going to be $4 a month to do that. Um, but this is not like price. Uh, yeah, this is not price to, to lock you out. I mean, these guys are making this accessible. Mm-hmm. And um, But you can also sync it through an encrypted database like uh, iCloud or Dropbox, you know? So there's a lot of ways to to do this stuff. But, you know, fundamentally, it is so different than Rome. But practically, it works in many of the same ways. You know, Rome is an outliner. Obsidian is a markdown writing app. You know, Obsidian stores all your data locally with markdown files. Rome stores it up in the cloud, you know? And the ubiquity of the markdown files we talked about with our the archive is something that is really great. Like I've got Obsidian files um, in a, an Obsidian folder on Dropbox, and then on my iPad because there's no there's no mobile version of Obsidian, but on my iPad I use OneWriter connected to that same mm-hmm. folder structure, and I can go in there and write on any of the Obsidian files on my iPad. And it's fine because they're just markdown files, you know, and then right. I save them. I even write links in them on an iPad. They don't connect. Actually, some of them actually connect through OneWriter, but a lot of them don't connect. But when I go back to my Mac, everything just works. So you can kind of use it, but it's it's not the same thing. Other similarities, but differences, you know, in Rome, everything is a block. and Obsidian, everything is a document, which means Rome is good for outlining and Obsidian is good for writing. and. I don't think it's going to replace Ulysses, but if you're doing writing and you want to work, you know, from your, your big database, you can do that. Mm -hmm. It's just fascinating to me. And I, I just, I'm really, I really like this little app and I, uh, I hope it makes it, you know, I mean, it's at this weird stage right now where I know the people behind it are putting their blood, sweat and tears into it, but at some point it has to make enough money to make it worth it to them. Yeah. But they're doing the right things with this app. And I could absolutely see this in a year. You know, I'm super curious to see where we are in a year. You know, uh, Maybe Obsidian is gone and Rome is dominant. Or maybe both of them are gone and we're all in DevonThink because DevonThink has made so much progress. I, I just think anything is possible right now. But one scenario that is possible is that Obsidian is going to turn into the real deal. I mean, think of all the small developer apps that we use all the time. I use drafts every day. It's got one developer behind it. You mm-hmm. know, um, my node is a very small team that makes an app. That's amazing. You know, e- people think of the Omni group as a big company. The team working on Omni focus, it's just a few people really, you know? Um, so I, I think of um, a lot of the apps that I use every day that have small development teams and I could see obsidian fitting right into this in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. I hope, I hope it goes well for them. Uh, CGP Gray has also talked spoken about Obsidian on a recent episode of Cortex. I'll try to dig that up for the show notes. Um, so he kind of went through a, a big upheaval in his notes taking, <laughs> if you will. And he, uh, you and Gray went on the same spiritual quest, 
I'll leave it. At th- I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. I'm aware he's been working on. It. I need to go listen to it and see what he ended up with. So, did he end up with Rome or Obsidian? I don't want to spoil the episode. But... All right, I'll, I'll go check. I'll <laughs> okay, go check. I won't spoil the episode. <laughs> yeah, but the uh, it it really is an interesting app to me, and to me, I think the thing that makes me favor Obsidian is that I just feel like I understand it better. Yeah, like it's it's Markdown files that I control, and um. There are things about Rome that I like, you know, better, but Obsidian just works for me. And like both of them have customizable CSS, so you can change the the look of the app very easily. You know, in Obsidian, you just go into the preferences and people are uploading new CSS models all the time. And I understand Rome's the same way, but I just, I don't know. Obsidian is working for me, even though I don't have the same level of linkage but if I had to choose one right now, well, I, I have chosen. I'm using Obsidian mm-hmm. for a lot of this research right now. And I think that's only going to become more so. And I'm really looking forward to their weekly updates because they just keep, it's like every week you get a major new feature added. You yeah, know? that's cool. That's a fun time. <laughs> they added they added integration for Mermaid JS, which is a diagramming system with Markdown. Mm-hmm. It's a Markdown language kind of that creates diagrams. And Obsidian just builds them for you. Like you can outline something you're working on um, with Markdown text. It's just like, I mean, this is nerdy stuff, but it's fun. It's not going to replace my calendar, my task manager, my diary. Right. But it is something that is going to be useful for me. Hey, gang. David here with a little extra drop-in at the end of our Obsidian segment. You know how I said that they were working on block-level quotes and block embeds? And I thought that it was a good idea, but I didn't know how they were going to do it with Markdown files. Well, about two hours after we finished recording, they released an insider build that has block references and block embeds. They're doing it by creating a unique ID number for each section of your Markdown file. It's pretty ingenious. I've been using it for a day and it works. So block level references and embeds are now also a thing with Obsidian. Now I'm going to time travel back to the show. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the the other apps that do fit into this category. Um, we've mentioned Notion several times. Again, we're going to do a f- full show on that, working on a guest. Notion is one of those tools that people do build their whole lives into because you can have text or databases, like all this stuff. Uh, it is a f- like a full-blown, it's almost like a, an operating system <laughs> for your entire life or your entire brain. So it's much more than these research tools are. It's a different thing. But if you don't mention Notion in the same sentence as Rome and these others, uh, you know, people people get upset. Yeah. And I just like Notion just added the ability to do backlinks. But uh, for the kind of research app I'm thinking, and since we make the show, I guess I get to decide. Yep. <laughs> That's know, right. Um, Rome is the better Rome is the better fit for it. But like for instance, the Max Sparky, I've got several people helping me with things I'm working on. Like that latest video I published, I had some animation in it. So I've got a person helping me with that. Like I'm seriously considering Notion as like the backbone of that, where we can have multiple people log in and it's a system for stuff like that. But I don't really see it as a comparison to this type of stuff. Um, there is, I think like an open source pro- project right now called Foam. F-O-A-M, you know, uh, you'll never guess what app that is very similar to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I haven't looked into that. Um, remnote.io is another one that I just ran out of time for. And my beloved drafts could be a solution for this. Drafts has linking mm-hmm. in it. And of course, the drafts community has already created drafts actions that do backlinks. So if you're already using drafts, and you use the double bracket, you know, wiki style linking in your drafts notes, and you go back to the page that has is the destination of those links, you can run this action, and I'll put a link in the show notes to download that action, and get backlinks for that. But, I mean, drafts is does so much more. These other apps are custom built for this problem. So, you know, it's just a question of how much are you going to use it. If you're not going to use it that often, then you can get by with drafts. If you're going to try and really go all the way in you might want to look at some of these other apps yeah i think that's a good uh piece of advice something that's been running throughout this episode is just the idea of url links i think if you're interested in this stuff 
that is the glue that you need to really consider. All of these tools are very friendly for URL links. With Roam, every page is a website, basically. So because it's a web tool, you can just copy the link to anything you've got, and then you can jump directly to it in the future. Uh, with DevonThink, everything in DevonThink can be turned into a link. Um, with um, Obsidian, they added a um, they added a feature where you can turn any page into a link as well. I, in fact, I posted to the Obsidian forums recently a a little um, a keyboard master script I built that generates those links for you. So all this stuff is linkable, and I find this tremendously useful. We're we're going to do a show at some point on this whole idea of, of contextual computing. It's just like because the more I play with, the more I realize this is really a big help for people where you can jump directly to the workspace, but all of these apps let you do that. And I think that that's a big deal. Uh, any that wouldn't do it, I frankly wouldn't probably make it into the outline, but there's just a lot of other tools out there. And hook is the app that allows you to create those links. If you don't already have a way to create them, you know, some apps build it in some of them you need to, to do it through something like hook. You want to talk a little bit about how we're using this stuff? Yeah, I mean, I feel like we've done some of this as we've gone, but just to put it all in one place, uh, I'm using DevonThink for my entire database of Apple and tech history resources. So it's everything from web pages whose contents, you know, I've scraped for old articles to PDFs, images, uh, HTML, all sorts of things. I have it categorized into several different uh, collections or different vaults where I've got these big headers of hardware, software, publications, that sort of thing. And then, you know, uh, a collection inside of there may be a Mac user where I have all, you know, PDFs of every Mac user magazine, et cetera. I'm up to, let me see, uh, over 20,000 items in Dev and Think. And I sync it all to Dropbox and have it on iOS through their app. And it has really, really solved the problem I had where a lot of the stuff I had scattered across a bunch of folders and Finder. I had some of it in Evernote back in the day. It was, it was, I did not have a cohesive place where I'm going to write or produce something that involves this research where it's all in one place. So our recent Intel era episode, a lot of that timeline stuff came out of my DevonThink database of being able to search for when did this machine come out? What did reviewers say? What were the issues? That sort of thing. And it has been a, a huge help for me in knowing where all that stuff is. And, and then again, getting to it quickly when I need it. Yeah, I mean, I've really come to think of DevonThink as my version of Evernote, but better than Evernote in every conceivable way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Don't write me if you're an Evernote fan. It's cool. I get it. But the um, I just really love the tool set, and we, we talked about it at length. So a lot of the stuff I collect goes into uh, DevonThink, mm -hmm. but I've really kind of gravitated through this process to Obsidian for research and thoughts. And, you know, the, the three areas of my life are uh, legal, Max Barkey, and personal. The legal stuff is heavily DevonThink with some work in Obsidian. Um, usually I get what I need out of DevonThink to get started, and then I write, you know, legal briefs and whatnot in Ulysses. Um, the Max Barkey stuff and the field guide research, again, is a combination of DevonThink and Obsidian. And then uh, the personal stuff, you know, I have been taking notes on things I read and write and watch for a long time. And so I had this big collection of notes. Um, I had them, I've had kept that in Apple notes. I've kept it in drafts. I've, it's all been marked down for a long time. So I moved that into um, Obsidian and I've been pretty happy with it. It's not, the move isn't complete yet, but the the project in my head for the longest time is what I, what I called um, Sparky OS. Mm -hmm. And that kind of started with Mac OS X. You know, I always liked the idea, well, an operating system for a computer, why not an operating system for a human? And so things that I study or think about in relation to how do I interact with the world and how do I want to, um, what kind of person do I want to be, is the Sparky OS. And 
Um, I've got all sorts of thoughts and ideas in there, and I've really started embracing that into Obsidian, which is something that I had the idea for when I was in Rome, but I never was willing to do because Rome is on the internet and doesn't have a great security model, you know. Uh, but I feel completely safe doing it in Obsidian. So I, I started that project throughout the plan for this episode, and I'm looking forward to digging deeper into that. Mm-hmm. And another thing I've been trying to play with with Obsidian is, uh, is that, you know, there's all these different problems we're trying to solve. I, on the legal side, I deal a lot with clients and opposing counsel and trying to keep track of where particular things stand and, you know, when did we talk about this? Um, and I, I've always wanted kind of a diary system I could rely on and never really felt right doing that in day one day one is kind of my journal it's not really where i log stuff like that right although i've done experiments with it and it can work and they have end-to-end encryption mm-hmm. so there there's ways to make that work rome really attracted to me to the idea with the, because the links are so powerful like i could make a link for a project and every person involved with the project and everything is its own page so i can always go back and backlink my way to figure out what was going on or what's happening uh, but because of the security model, I didn't feel comfortable doing it at Rome. So I've been experimenting with that in Obsidian, and I've been very happy with the results. So it's not really a diary so much as just like a log. Like, and like I can see every day, you know, every day I log this, the major things I work on. Like I can see every day that I worked in the outline for this show through an Obsidian backlink system. And I don't know if this is just me being a nerd. But I actually find use in this. And I, I'm not exactly sure what all this means yet, but it's something that I'm exploring with and something I'd feel comfortable doing with an app like Obsidian because it's data I control. Yeah, having things on your local disk, that's just hard to beat. <laughs> it's it's yeah. especially when you, you do think about those sort of long term ramifications. Um, you know, for for me as far as note taking. I'm I'm in Apple Notes. And as we were talking and preparing, I was sort of going through my Apple Notes library. You know, I got 400 things in there. And a lot of what's in there could benefit from something with backlinking. And and right now, it's kind of just in categories, and I do a lot of searching. So I feel like I have an opportunity to dig into some of this stuff. But uh, so far, it's just kind of been hanging out in Apple Notes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't even use the you know, the nerd call to action PKM, like if you reach it, personal knowledge management, you know, uh, do not search that on YouTube or you will fall down a hole. But the, um, but everybody's like got this PKM, what's your PKM? You know, how are you holding all your stuff together? What's your, it's, it's kind of an offshoot of the second brain stuff, but that is the kind of stuff this stuff could be used for if you want it. Like when, when you tell me you've got 400 notes in Apple notes, an easy way for you to do that would be just to put that in drafts and start making links and you could use the drafts action, but you could also use something like obsidian and both of those tools are plain text files Mm -hmm. that you can remove and put anywhere else you want. Um, there, what I'm saying, you know, sometimes I go off on tangents on this show and people get mad at me, but I feel like this is an emerging area of technology right now. And as nerds, it's always fun to see something sprout up. And this is definitely happening here. There's like this kind of revolution of cross link notes that we're getting. And people are coming at it from different angles. Rome is doing it on the web. Obsidian is doing it with a, a layer on top of your Markdown notes. Uh, DevonThink has always been able to do it, but they're getting better at it. And it's like all these people are putting time and effort into making this easier for us. And as someone who started using it, I see results. I mean, the fact that I'm tracking progress on individual shows is really helpful to me. And it allows me to keep track of what's going on. And everything is a URL link, so I can get back to it really easily. Like, um, when I say I track a show, let me just give that as an example. This show uh, started as a text file in drafts, but I moved it over to Obsidian as I was doing these experiments. But in the note for this show, I have the record date, the publish date, the list of advertisers. I have links to the OmniFocus project for this, which is a URL link. I have a link to the Google Sheet, which is the outline for this. You know, All this stuff is just tied together. And then in Obsidian, I've got backlinks to show me every day that I worked on it and all the other shows that reference it in the outline. It's just, it's just like this 
it's like I'm holding the reins of this, you know, <laughs> massive enterprise through a couple of markdown text files. And I wanted to share it with the audience. And I'm glad you did. This is, this is an exciting corner of the the app nerd universe. And I think one that is definitely worth keeping up with. I agree with you. I'm very excited to see where all this stuff lands in the next year or so. Well, it's definitely a different way to use your computer. Um, we will get some guests in the future that are power using some of this stuff and and bring you more workflows. And frankly, as my um, and Steven's workflows increase with these and as we look at the apps, we'll keep you posted. But I think this is a, t- a topic of interest to the Mac power users. Well, I think that does it. All right. Well, thanks to our sponsors, Microsoft, Hover, One Password, and Smile. Uh, if you're using these apps, let us know in the forums what you're doing with them, what works, what doesn't work. I'm super curious to hear uh, how much of this has made it down to the to the Mac Power Users listeners. I suspect there's quite a few of you that are are trying these out as well. You can find us over at relay.fm slash MPU. You can find the forums at talk.macpowerusers.com. And we'll see you next week.